Okay, John, you touched on a bit from um, you were doing the form, the tipping sheet. Yeah. Uh, so how did the, act, the job of the transfer to the sporting life come about? Well, I adore, the, still do the sporting life. Happiest days of my life were with the sporting life. And it was um, the trade paper taken over lately, much later on by the Racing Post. Before I go any further, let no one say that the sporting life was better than the Racing Post. It wasn't. You just compare the Racing Post now, the detail they've got, the in-depth analysis they've got, the, the facts they've got, the wide variety and the way they cover racing. Everything is much better in the Racing Post. Now, most of that, most, I'll say only most, that is, is to do with the machines. And obviously the internet and all the machines. I used to, when I worked on the Sporting Life, used to go down at 8.10, I had to be down on what they call the stone. So underneath the um, Daily Mirror and Sporting Life offices was the printing presses. And at 8.10, the first rushes came off and you had to change anything. And to, so, you, I, I, you know, I came with a bit of an oily and a greaser and being nice to the print lads. Please change that, that is terrible, and all that sort of thing, because it was all typed out down there, unlike on the machines now. So, um, journalism then was um, not done on the machines. You know, I always, always use, use, use the example, for instance, in, in now, if, you, if, you, if you're in a newsroom and you say, how do you spell Hillary, we used to shout out for Hillary Clinton, was it double L or one? Nobody knew, or you guessed, and all that. Now they go on the machine, everything, every fact they want. Where did the horse win? Was it any good here? And this, that, and the other. What was that scandal there? Everything's available to you. In our day, we either had to know it, or had to shout round for it, or get it wrong. And it was usually get it wrong, but I'll, I'll keep quiet about that. But the sporting life was. Um, was I'd say I was so proud to work in the sporting life. It came about. I worked on form index, and. Um, I then got a, um, a, a chap who, who and I was very interested in field sports. By the way, great lesson to all of you. If you want to judge what a human being is like in one sentence or one quote, are, are, are they saying when they're talking about the, the countryside, is it field sports or blood sports? Now, anyone who says field sports, he's all right or she's all right. Right, there's nothing wrong with them and all that thing. But basically, they're sound, solid, good eggs if they say field sports. Once they say blood sports, you know you've got trouble because they are so wrong. They're condemning their animals to horrible deaths. There'd be no foxes and hares alive in this country now if we hadn't had hunting. So, and, and, and the mock hunts that we have now keep them going. So always judge people, the one phrase, blood sports, don't like you. You're not, you're not part of me, you know, you're probably a vegetarian as well, that's another thing, God. So, field sports, okay. You know, if you're field sports, you've got something good inside you. Anyway, so interested in field sports. Um, the chap who did the field sports for the um, sporting life, we got, got very old and very ill, and uh, we were regular doing the, the Waterloo Cup, which was the big field, the big field sports event. And so I, I sort of was asked or volunteered or whatever it was, to go out to the countryside and it was between about, I think the, the um, opened up in September or October and ended with the Waterloo Cup in late February, I think it was, and reporting for the Sporting Life. So I, I was a reporter for the Sporting Life on um, hair coursing. And uh, I remember one of the quotes that I remember of, 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 that I remember most was that Peter Wilson, who was the father of Julian Wilson, who became the BBC Racing Correspondent, and he was my mate at Harrow, I'll talk about him in a minute. But Peter Wilson was one of the great Leviathans of the press, like Desmond Hackett. Desmond Hackett of the Express, the man in the brown bowler, and Peter Wilson. And it was in the days when there was virtually no television coverage of football. So at the grounds, in the press box, if, Jul if, if Peter Wilson was there, and Desmond Hackett were there and that, the crowds used to applaud them because they were at an event where these two great men had turned up. And if they were there, it was an important event. And an extraordinary thing. You can imagine applauding a mere hack and all that sort of thing. Anyway, Peter Wilson turned his attention to hair coursing uh, once a year at the Waterloo Cup. It was the Waterloo Cup, 64 dogs, knockout competition. 
um, and, and their plates and all that sort of thing, and extra co and consolation events. And um, Peter Wilson said, you know, Daily Mirror, you can imagine what they thought about the air course in the Daily Mirror. God, and that was the days in the Daily Mirror, so four or five million copies, unlike now. And, um, and Peter Wilson wrote once, the screams of the dying hairs will live with me till I die. Screams will live with me till I die. That, that was Peter Wilson. That's the opposition you were up against. He wasn't too welcome up on, at Orca um, in, during, during, during the running of the Waterloo Cup. But it was, um, yeah, so I was doing, doing you know, the hair coursing and it was, um, came from, you know, obviously the sporting life recognised and everything like that. So they called me down to the office and I started working in the sporting life on what they call returns, which were the results. So when they came in, you then had to sub up the results and all that sort of thing. And I became a sub editor on, on the um, Sporting Life, and then um, then you did bits of journalism and all that sort of thing. So, um, but I, I just love working on the Sporting Life. Love the people there. They, a lot of them hated me. Yeah, I was a member. I was a member of the NUJ, National Union of Journalism, but not of the Horse Race Writers and Photographers Association, the local trade group. And um, why I wasn't a member of that is dependent upon who you want to believe. My, my story is that I wouldn't join those horrible people who, I always call them supine. Racing journalists are the most supine of all groups of journalists that I know. They hardly ever have a go at trainers and owners, the corruption in racing, what's wrong with it. There are exceptions, I fully accept that. But compared to any other activity from politics to football, cricket, whatever it is, whatever sport it is, industrial affairs, the journalists really are virtually fearless and have their go at, uh, having a go at them. Racing a supine, they want to keep in with the owners and they want to keep in with the trainers and the jockeys and all that sort of thing. And it's, it's so shameful. So whatever it was, I'm not a member of the Horse Race Writers group, never have been, so not been able to vote in their elections. But I think the truth is they wouldn't have me anyway. So what am I to say? But you've been a, a little bit modest there, John, because um, I do know you won two awards for campaign journalism. Um, can you tell me what those were about? Well, they were two very bad years. Very bad crops with virtually no stories. But it was the British Press Awards. And um, it, was, um, it was Specialist Writer of the Year in 78 and Campaigning Journalist of the Year in 79. And Margaret Thatcher gave me the um, prize and gave me the award in '79 at a at a hotel in London. And um, because of that, I then uh, asked if I could interview her because it was the time of the Moscow Olympics it was coming up in 1980, and um, there was a campaign that our athletes shouldn't go to Moscow because the Russia had invaded Afghanistan. And I argued, and some, a lot of people did argue. That had Russia invaded France, for instance, we wouldn't be going off to Moscow for the Olympics. So why? Because Afghanistan was a poor, faraway place of which we knew, knew little. We were doing the same. Thatcher agreed. So I did an interview with her, with her in Downing Street. It was published in the Daily Mail. And um, it was a difficult one whether I do it now and believe that now. Um, the world's changed. But, um, you know, it was... Um, it, it was, it was, you know, I was proud of it, but in fact, I realised the the awards, you know, the, the um, specialist writer of the year was for covering Miss World. I remember I covered Miss World, and um, you know, what, 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 I'm trying to remember. Yeah, um, there was a, the American contestant in Miss World was called Debbie Cool or something, something like that, and I said, well, she left me cold. Now you go and print that in the paper today and you see what happened to you. So it was, um, um, all, it was all very difficult. And the um, campaigning journalist, it was, it was a good campaign because the um, tote were fixing dividends after the result of the race was known. In other words, they were putting money into pools after the, race, the result of the race was known. So um, I sort of, um, you know, kept, kept, the, kept published the story because it came into me and I was doing the returns. And I couldn't believe there was a horse, a big price winner, but it was a very short, a short, very short tote return. 
So I rang up, um, I won't bring any names here, I rang up the, the spokesman for the tote. He said, well, how, how do you get a dividend like this? Oh, there was late money for it or something like that. I said, well, this is suspicious. It's like a 25 to 1 chance to return 3 or 4 to 1, something like that. Anyway, um, so the campaign ran on. Woodrow Wyatt was chairman of the tote and he was going on and on and um, saying it's absolutely untrue, the tote would never, would never do this and we were, we were audited and all that sort of thing. And uh, it got to Parliament, I got questions asked in Parliament, one or two MPs I knew asked questions. It's the only time, I think, that, that Margaret Thatcher, she was Prime Minister at the time, has answered a question in, uh, at PMQ's, Prime Minister's questions, has answered, well, I'm sorry, I don't know that, uh, the answer that I'll pass it on to my friend, the Home Secretary, which, which was Willie Whitelaw, who loved, it, who loved his racing. First time Margaret Thatcher couldn't ask, ask, answer a question about Woodrow Wyatt, <clears throat> because she was great friends with Woodrow Wyatt, and that's what saved him in the end. There was a great sort of call for Wyatt to resign and all that sort of thing, which didn't happen. And um, then the extraordinary thing that came out afterwards, that um, at Royal Ascot, there'd been um, the dividend had been given to Wyatt of a horse, a winner at Royal Ascot, and it was much, much shorter than the um, than the official SP which had already been given out. So Wyatt went down to the the control office of the tote and told them to change the dividend round. Now that to me was absolutely whatever you're doing. Whether you're defrauding punters, defrauding bookmakers, you cannot do that. But he got away with it. He admitted it. And in just the one occasion he said, you can't imagine how many times else it was done. That was the sort of egotism of Woodrow Wyatt. And um, I wasn't very popular at um, a barred from tote lunches and all. It was a terrible sacrifice I had to make. But, <clears throat> but campaigning journalist of the year, there can't have been many other campaigns if that one won it, but I managed to win it. Managed to win it.